Thank you. So uh, my name is, is uh, Daniel Lemire, and um, I'm going to tell you about um, accurate and uh, efficient benchmarking. Um, I do most of my benchmarks uh, into cloud, uh, but the talk is not going to be cloud specific, though I will allude to uh, cloud uh, specific issues um, as part of the talk. So uh, really quick about my background. So one of the work, I, I, do, I do different, I work on different problems, but one of the um, uh, work we did was to build um, what might be like the fastest uh, JSON parser uh, on, on community processors in the world. And uh, we were the first to parse uh, JSON at, at gigabytes per second. Um, so basically uh, this is, uh, just to give you the context of the way I, I think about um, how to benchmark. So um, uh, for this talk, uh, this talk is experimental. So I've got uh, a link. Uh, you can email me later if, if you don't want to write that down. But all of the all of the the, the examples, everything I am sharing, all of the code. Uh, so uh, where do I come from? Well. Um, you might be uh, interested in knowing uh, how fast a, a disk can go these days, right? And so, uh, if you're if you're uh, if you've good machine, you're probably hitting five gigabytes per second right now. And there are disks that are soon to be widely available that can hit ten gigabytes per second. And well, this is all known to you guys, but. Uh, the CPU frequencies are, are stagnating. Sometimes it's interesting to put numbers into it. So uh, I've got old, my possibly one of my oldest server is a Skylake processor. And, and, and now on Amazon, you have uh, Ice Lake servers all, all over. And uh, you know the maximum frequency is actually going down. And, and not that I recommend switching uh, to Skylake, uh, there are benefits to, to more recent processors, but clearly we have a problem. So uh, a little bit like the previous uh, uh, speaker, uh, but in the more extreme manners, I, I say, I, I focus on say, well, if you look at a single core processor uh, and if you're doing data processing, you're very often CPU bound. And so of course you want to optimize your code. And one of the problems that we have when you want to optimize the code this is very basic, by the way, right? Is that we want to, tr to see whether we're on the right track, right? So one way to optimize code is to rewrite all of it and hope that it's going to be faster. Uh, a more practical matter is to just tweak it. And then you look, did I make things better? And then it's like a, a steepest descent, right? So you're not doing deep learning, but you're basically uh, using the same strategy, right? Trying to uh, get to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to at least a local, uh, optimum. So scientifically, because I view it as a scientific question, you've got a piece of code and then you've got a, a set of changes. So a, a, typically a commit. Uh, and you want to know whether it improves the performance, right? So it looks fairly simple. So you, you, you if you're doing C++, you grab uh, Google benchmarks and you, uh, you, you measure the time before, the time after. And if the time is lower, then you conclude that uh, you've improved matters. Unfortunately, that does not work. Um, uh, we're dealing with complex systems, uh, so changes can have multiple effects, and uh, it's a little bit naive to say, well, there's a time before and a time after. Um, if you're dealing with um, virtual machines uh, and JIT compilers, uh, then uh, life is really, really difficult sometimes. Uh, so the authors of the paper, Virtual Machine uh, Warm-Up Blows Hot and, hot and Cold, have shown that uh, contrary to your expectation, uh, in a lot of cases when you're benchmarking, you actually get non-trivial fluctuations over time. That is, even if you keep running the same function again and again and again, you don't actually reach a steady stage, a state. So this means that uh, <laughs> the speed of a given function is a little bit problematic. Uh, so let's assume we don't do that. Uh, so let's assume to it's just easier to benchmark uh, if you're doing like C++ or Rust or something like that. 
So uh, of course, system calls are uh, an entirely different business. And so, uh, and, and let's assume that uh, we take them out of the equation because they're very complex. Um, so data access, like the previous talk, uh, can be very, very expensive. And if you change your data structures, then it can affect uh, you know, the timings quite a lot. So let's assume we keep that uh, constant. Uh, if you have uh, really, really tiny functions, then uh, measuring, uh, measuring them can be very difficult. So let's assume we're not doing that. So, so because basically there's an institute uh, principle trying to uh, you know, measure something that's really, really small requires a lot of care. So let's assume we're measuring something non-trivial. So we're not um, you know, measuring like um, a function that does one addition, for example, right? That would be very, really hard. So, so I just pick an example, right? So let's uh, let's uh, so we have Unicode strings, right? So most codes these days are Unicode, uh, and uh, there are two popular formats: so UTF-16 and UTF-8. And let's say you transcode. So basically, you you have uh, UTF-16, which is popular on Windows and um, and uh, the different platforms, and you want to bring it to web where it's UTF-8. And say let's say let's take to make things really clean and easy. We take an 80 kilobyte uh, Arabic string. It's in memory, not on disk. And and you want to, and you have one function. And then you just measure each time you run it, you measure the time elapsed in nanoseconds. Easy enough. Okay, so what you get is actually the screen there. Uh, to, to, well, this is one run. If you run it multiple times, you're not going to get the same thing. And if you use a different computer, you're going to get something different and so forth. But that's what I got. It's one instance. So you see that that's very interesting. The first uh, the first run was um, uh, significantly slower um, for different reasons, and then and then uh, you've got this kind of a steady state, and then you've got these uh, big large bumps, and then more large bumps, and then it goes back to a low steady state. Okay, so so what do you do? Well, very often people take the average time, right? So, and they make this implicit assumption, which is not in the literature, typically in the literature people, people who actually make it explicit, they're a little bit farther than that. But a lot of people in their mind, that's what they have. They assume that basically I've got the true value of my, um, of my uh, timing and I've got some white noise. That is, I've got noise that it follows a um, normal distribution with some variance. And we're basically seeking the time. So that's what people think. And if that's what they think, then there's a really nice trick you can do, right? So uh, if you have noise uh, that is normally distributed around a value, then you can just do an average. And if you take enough measurements, then your standard deviation will go down. This is uh, all Wikipedia level stuff, by the way, this is not fancy. So, so the standard deviation will go down as the square root of N, right? So, uh, let, let's make sure the math, uh, because let's not trust Wikipedia. Maybe they're lying to us. So let, 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 let's use Python. I, I'm not going to go through this code, but basically what I'm doing here in this code is, is that I'm, um, I'm basically uh, taking like an average of 20 measures or up to a a, a 2,000. So basically, you know, I'm looking at a really s small set of measures. I do just only 12 measurements, or I do a lot of measurements, uh, 2,000. And what I get is, wow, okay, so Wikipedia was right and uh, the, the, the physics textbooks are right. The more you measure, uh, the, more, the more measures you, you average, you know, the down the error goes. Okay, so let's try to do it. So I, I, I've defined my function with a very reasonable function, right? Transcoding a string, there's nothing magical about that. It's uncontroversial. And let's write some C++ code. I'm not going to go through it, but you can trust that it's more or less equivalent to Python code, except that I take my measures and, and all my code is available, by the way. And I get that. So you see that I can take the average of 2000 measurements or the average of uh, 200. And basically it's not clear that it's, this is the standard deviation of my measures. It's not clear that it's going down. Uh, of course, one is uh, one is a hundred times more expensive than the other to to measure, but basically, it's not clear that it's more accurate. 
So why might that be? Okay, so we made the assumption that we were dealing with a normal distribution. Um, so that's a normal distribution. How do you know you don't have a normal distribution? An easy test is to look for sigma events, right? So we should all know that. If you've got basically a normal distribution, then it's basically impossible to measure a five sigma event. That is something that is five standard deviation away from the mean. It's basically impossible. You should not, if that happens, then you're pretty sure you don't have a normal distribution. So let's write a little, pro okay. Let's write, that, write a little program and see that we'll do that. And here's basically the math if you're interested. So like a five sigma is like so improbable that you might as well win the lottery. And if you go down and get the formula, if you care about it, again, that's all Wikipedia level stuff. So it's not fancy. So here's my function. I just run it and I measure the time. And I even have a, this is one run. If you run it differently, it's, it's on my laptop. It's a very nice laptop. It doesn't do anything weird. Um, and and uh, I've got that 13 sigma event, which makes no sense. This is absolutely impossible. So basically, I've proven to you that at least in this specific instance, it's not normally distribu distributed. So what might it be? Well, again, on the controversial, if you go into the literature, they'll tell you typically what you find is a log normal distribution. Okay, so uh, log normal is like this. Basically, you've got uh, a minimum, the average, or to median that's a bit fairly close to, to uh, minimum, and you got, you've got a really, really long tail. So let's see if it works, right? So I'm going to do my Python thing, right? And there we go. It looks a lot closer to my real measurements, right? I've not proven that my, you know, that my my measurements were falling log normal, but but you can see that it does not go down. The the error does not go down. It's all over. Um. Okay, so if you've got the log normal, right? Got the log normal. You assume that you've got a, well. This is no. This is actually based on, on on real measures. But if you've got the log normal, then why would you care specifically about the average? Because typically, you know, most um, most people with the measurements they use they go with the average, and in some cases this makes perfect sense. So if you've got, you're measuring a very complex system with a lot of components, and it, it could be uh, normally distributed. But if you're doing um, you know, narrow micro benchmarks like I was doing right now, uh, you're more likely to have something that's closer to law normal. And if you look at the average, right, you can see that my average has a fairly high uh, relative standard deviation. This means that basically my measurement error you know, is around 3%. Now this makes it a little bit tricky because if I improve my function by 3%, then I can't tell, right? Because my measure is not accurate enough. But if I look at minimum, right? The minimum value, then it's significantly more accurate, right? It's almost three times more accurate. This means that if I compare the minimum between, you know, I've got one function, I optimize it somehow. So I've got two runs and I compare it to minimum, then I'm going to get a much uh, tighter measure. So, um, so my argument here is that uh, very often one should look at the minimum measure, especially if you're doing purely computational work, because you're going to get something that's uh, more accurate. So, what might you do uh, to to do to get something that's even better? Well. What's interesting these days is that most commodity processors have um, so-called performance counters, right? So they're basically zero overhead counters that record some uh, specific measures. So they could be like the number of instructions that are being retired, the actual number of cycles, CPU cycles, and, and, or, 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 and so forth, right? Now, in the good old days, what I used to do to to really uh, uh, you know control my um, my, 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 my measures is that I would try to uh, freeze the CPU uh, frequency of the processor, right? I would say, okay, well, you know, I would instruct uh, uh, Linux to, to, to tell the processor to run at a given set frequency. Now, if you're going to the cloud, right? Uh, it's not clear that Amazon will let you do that. Um, maybe Google will if you work there, I don't know. But if you, if you go to Amazon, it won't let you do it. But my, my argument here is that you don't need to do it because these days you can actually measure the number of cycles. 
So you know the frequency your function was running at. You can measure it very accurately. So with zero over it, this means that you can reason about what's happening, right? Um, so there are some limitations. Um, typically, one of the problems is that you can only measure certain things. So you can measure like mispredicted branches, uh, you know, instruction and retire. Uh, you can measure a few. Uh, it depends on the processor. Um, uh, but typically, you cannot measure like 25 things at the same time. So sometimes it's a little bit complicated. And you need privileged access, right? Typically, it means like root or something like that. Now, what happens if you're in the cloud? Well, uh, that's why I really like the new ARM processors uh, made available by, by, um, by Amazon, because uh, they're, they're immediately available. Even if you get the smallest, the, you know, the small instances where you've got to I don't know, you might have one core or something, maybe two cores, I don't know, yeah, maybe two cores. Uh, and they're, right, they're available. So you can just uh, instrument your code, you can record uh, your performance counters uh, on, on, on these processors very, very easily. Now, uh, on X64 processors, then unfortunately you need a full CPU. Um, now, the previous uh, speaker, uh, you know, had maybe lots of uh, expensive equipment and it could rent uh, machines that uh, would cost $11 an hour and so forth, which is not unreasonable. But very often, if you do a lot of work, that gets a little bit expensive. Uh, if you're cheap like me, you try to go with, uh, you know, the minimum number of course, and then unfortunately, you don't get the, the, the performance contours. Okay, so so why would you care about counting instruction? So here I'm revisiting the exact same problem. So I'm doing transcoding uh, of Unicode uh, of a Unicode string, and I'm recording uh, the number of instructions ret uh, retired. So basically, that that counts exactly the number. Well, plus there's you know always uh, uh, there's always a little bit of error because you know just measuring. You know, it's hard to be extremely precise about, uh, uh, so you might have a, a constant error uh, that you do at the beginning, at the end of the measure. But, uh, but because my number here of instructions is fairly high, I can trust at a very good uh, accuracy. And, and, you, and you can see that it works, right? So, so it looks, if, you, if you're back in, at the, the end of the room, it, it almost looks like maybe uh, it's bad because I've got these big peaks, uh, but they're actually very, very, very tiny. They actually represent, if you look at the y-axis, the y-axis uh, almost tells you that this is entirely flat. Like if I were a good scientist, I would require that my y-axis starts at zero. And if I did that, then you would just do, a, you would just, you just see a really, really straight line. So they're extremely accurate, which means that if if you if you compare two versions of your function and you're recording the number of instructions ret retired, uh, you can tell almost certainly whether one requires few instruct fewer instructions than the other, right? Even if the change is tiny, you can you can uh, tell with very good accuracy. Now, unfortunately, very often um, performance counters are not built in into tools that we're using. Uh, but they're they're freely available. So there are uh, Java frameworks where people can get uh, you know uh, instruction counters. Uh, in, in C C they're they're available uh, through functions in, in uh, the Linux kernel. So that's fairly nice. Uh, they're also available on um, um, Apple processors uh, fairly easily. You can either use their um, Xcode uh, a toolkit or you can. Uh, uh, you, you well can still code from me um, because I, I benchmark on my uh, laptop, Mac laptop, quite a bit. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are initiatives actually to, to go programming language. They, they want to uh, uh, they want to include the instruction counters. I, I'm not sure it's ready yet, but it's only something people are working on. For the reason I explained, it's very 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 nice. Okay, so um, so so. My argument, at least on the type of problems that I work on, so of course it's going to differ. Like for example, previous speaker was uh, probably be uh, it was probably very often uh, entirely um, memory bandwidth bound, right? So that's then then counting instructions 
is much less useful, right? Because then uh, you, you might have very few instructions retired per cycle, but still get uh, something that's really, really fast. But in a lot of cases, a surprising number of cases, uh, re reducing the number of instructions can actually mean faster code, even in the case where you're, uh, in fact, even in the case where you're memory bound, very often because there's memory level parallelism, that is, uh, you know, your processor can, can access different regions uh, of the memory. Very often, the, the memory parallelism can be improved by reducing the number of instructions because the, the, the processor has limited in this respect. It can only, uh, uh, you know, issue loads from a window of instruction. So if you have fewer instructions, typically it's better. Um, uh, there's also problems with data dependency. So if you've got long the data dependency chains, then you you might be more limited by the data dependency than you might be by the number of instructions. Uh, so it does happen that uh, reducing the number of instructions in, in a, 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 while increasing the data dependency can make things worse. But that's kind of difficult to do. You got to be a little bit unlucky to do that. Um, the, the most interesting case that I find is branching. So branching is a very nice way to uh, lower the instruction count. So the way it goes is that you say, well, in most, in, in some cases, I don't need to do this pipe piece of work there. So I'll put a branch that checks whether it needs doing. And if it doesn't need doing, I'll skip it, right? And it looks like it's beautiful because then I've got fewer things to do, right? If you have fewer instructions to do. But if you're not careful when you're benchmarking, this can actually trip you. So let's look at a, a, an example um, where I do branching, right? So let's say I generate, this is, this is uh, you know, uh, this is pseudo code, but it, you can implement it, it's fairly nice. So what you do is you, um, you, you, you just run, so how many could be like how many times you want to run through the loop, and each time you're in the loop, you generate a random value. Uh, and if it's an odd integer, you do something, otherwise you don't do it, right? Fairly simple. So th this is an extreme case where the branch has a 50% probability, assuming you've got a nice function here, it's a 50% probability. So uh, what's going to happen if you benchmark something like that? Well, actually it depends on critically on how big Omini is. If Omini is very large, and by very large, I mean like, like like 50,000. If you've got 50,000 of those, it's fine. If you've got only 2,000 of those and you've got, and the random function is deterministic in the sense that each run that you do, you go through the same random numbers, right? Which, you know, happens. If you, when you're benchmarking, very often you do benchmarks not with purely random data, you do, you know, you do benchmarks with this more or less the same input, right? And, and, and so if you're doing that, what's happening here is really tricky. Uh, this, is, this is a Zen 2, this is, these are numbers from a Zen 2 processor. It only got better, but I did not update my table because the point is made. Uh, with 2000, you know, uh, iteration through the loop, at the first trial, you get 50% mispredicted branches. That's fine. Uh, after two, th and, and, and your code is going to be as slow as hell there because mispredicted branch is expensive uh, because basically the, comp the, comp the compiler predicts the branch, uh, mispredicts it as to flush to, to the instructions uh, and, and start again. So it's going to be really, really bad here. And, and the timings would reflect that. But if you repeat just eight times, eight times the, the 2000 uh, uh, iterations, you basically get that the AMD processor is able to predict almost perfectly the 2000 branches, right? Which means that basically uh, if you're only, and here it's going to look really nice because it's going to be fast and you're going to be, you have, you, you have saved instructions because of the branch, right? And so this will make it look really, really nice. But it's going to be misleading because in, a, in actual life, your code, if you test it in a real setting, it's going to be slow. I mean, it's like the previous code that I showed was a terrible idea. Um, so, so basically, the lesson here is that you should always seek to have fairly sizable, uh, uh, you know, fairly sizable benchmark. Um, 
So my, 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 my little takeaways here. Um, so this is something, this is in literature. It's not a discovery I made, uh, but very often people who benchmark, they don't look at what the literature on, on, on timings goes. And, and you got, you got normal distribution. And so I've been arguing for years that, uh, and people do that sometimes, that you should probably look at the, the minimum set of the average if you expect a log normal distribution. Uh, if you don't know kind of what kind of distribution you have, it's fairly easy to investigate if you're interested, right? Um, and because basically it improves the accuracy. Um, benchmarking often in the sense that, you know, like I make a change, I look at the timings, uh, it is really, really good. Uh, people are tempted very often because they see noise, they don't understand what's going on. And so what they do typically is that they increase the duration. So so very often I see people and uh, I work with students and you've got like uh, five minutes of benchmarks when it could take like uh, two seconds. What happens in these cases is that they get discouraged, they benchmark less often, and it's their their benchmarks are not necessarily market. So it depends on the problem. And sometimes it's a good strategy, but very often not very well. It depends on the problems you work on. on. In a lot of problems, it's not actually necessary to make it uh, to make it expensive. And so I argue that you should have really, really cheap, uh, well-designed benchmarks. And you can run a, run them into cloud, which would be a, an entirely different, well, not entirely uh, a more um, uh, a different talk, but I do run my benchmark personally into cloud. And and so even though I'm on say AWS servers, I still get re really, really good accuracy uh, with a good methodology. Uh, but you know, I, I run them exactly into cloud would be a different, uh, an interesting talk. Um, so for those that don't know me, you've got a blog where I blog every, uh, every week on, um, on performance issues and I've got a GitHub like everyone else and I'm on Twitter as well. So that's it. Questions, I guess. Chris, I kind of have yeah. a question on the, the instruction time. I, I think that you went a little, little bit over that. But I'm wondering, even considering all the complexity that goes in out of order execution computer, branch collections, and all of this, you still seem to defend that instruction time is a good metric. I do. I do for okay. So, so okay, okay. So, so basically, what what what, what the listener, um, the, the member of the audience, uh, asks is that with all the complexity, you still defend, you know, looking at uh, instruction counts because I guess your point would be that it could be a little bit naive, right? So to uh, well, you you're not you're not insulting me, but you're saying you're saying it could be a little bit naive. Okay. And I would agree. It looks it looked a little bit naive, right? Because you could say, "Well, okay, uh, it's so complex. You know, how can you reduce it all, all well, just to instruction?" What I'm saying is that it's fairly. It does happen. It's fairly hard to come up with a case where you're in, you're reducing substantially the number of instructions, and you actually make things worse. Typically, even if it's as I try to explain very quickly, even if you're memory bound. Very often, reducing the number of instructions is going to help. Um, there, there are that of course, I made the point that if you're changing your data structure, the layout of memory, then it's an entire different story because then you can, or if you're, you know, but yeah. I would make one comment relevant. The two count for instructions retired. Yes. Right? Which, at least for x86 processes, used to be a different matrix than total instructions. For example, right. uh, when, when French prediction is speculatively executed, that is not included in That's the right. instruction retired. That's which right. Which limits this, which, which mediates this. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, so it's a little bit complicated because these measures, you know, so the, the number of instructions retired, they're not issued. So, so that's why they specify, right? So there's the number of the instruction issued and some of them are, are fl flush and not even executed. Actually, they might be just, just, they, they weren't the pipeline. They're partially executed and they're, they're flush. Uh, yeah. So, so, in so you're really looking at the instructions that are actually doing actual work on x64 